today's guest, Michelle Appleby. Talent acquisition has a super awesome um, role where they actually get to see all that data, right, across different teams. So if you are a talent acquisition person and you're helping, you know, legal finance and marketing, right, for some reason that usually happens to be the trio. <laughs> together, they go together and they get hired, uh, the same talent acquisition partner. Um, what usually you have the opportunity to do is look at that data, right? And you compensation doesn't have to be the only place that compensation data is analyzed especially when we're talking about hiring rates, right? So you as a TA partner can say, hey, over the past, you know, three months, we've been hiring like crazy in these three departments that I am, you know, working with. And we've already talked to Comp and we understand that these particular roles are of, of similar value, even if they're in different departments, right? But I'm seeing some crazy stuff here. And in the moment, you know, I'm rolling with my hiring manager, but now a step back makes me go, wait, 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 what have we done here? Or even better, during the hiring processes with hiring managers saying, listen, we had a conversation last week about XYZ candidate and you were totally fine with the 120. Now, all of a sudden, a new candidate comes along and I can't see much difference in the value they're going to add to the organization. By the way, it's all a gamble. There's no such thing as anybody knowing for sure that someone's going to come in and add extreme value to the team. It doesn't work like that, right? You're taking a gamble. You do the best of your hiring process and you hope they come in and do a good job. Um, so it's also about talent acquisition partners. And it's a difficult to Look, I'm, I've never worked as a recruiter. I cannot imagine the amount of drama and conversation that is had with hiring managers and HR business partners. So I'm not trying to make it seem off the cuff easy. But it does require that those principles are in place, everybody understands them, everybody's accountable to following them, and there's always some challenge in that process to make sure we have fairness and pay. We talked about diversity, compensation, equal and unequal pay, the constraints, what to do about it, and an ideal work environment when it comes to inclusion and uh, pay, plus her model um, about diversity called the Dignity Model. Really exciting episode, Fruit for Thought, so tune in. Then you can build trust and then you can spend less time communicating and more time just getting shit done. Then I went home and, and thought about this sentence. We basically put it on the table. Hiring takes time. People are trained. How to objectively judge certain situations. It's very, 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 very hard to change things. That was the learning. Entrepreneurs with empathy. On the people side. Hey, Michelle, happy that we have um, our podcast today. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining, uh, not joining me, <laughs> asking me to be on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's really cool because um, I think Jesse, Jesse Schofer um, recommended um, yeah. to do, do episode as well. Um, she was not on the show yet, but um, she might come as well. We work together at Tier and Tax Fix, but we are already in conversations because um, this will also be, um, we, we also have some exciting topics to discuss. Um, but today we talk about, um, the dignity standard um, and many more, but maybe you give us a bit more context about yourself to start. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I am Nichelle. I'm from the States. I was born and raised in Georgia. I spent uh, most of my education, higher education in the North, so in Rhode Island, and went to school for finance and investments, actually. So uh, after that, I worked a bit, um, and then I moved to London for my master's degree, my MBA, and then back to the States and um, worked in executive, executive compensation. So my first job right after undergrad was exec comp. My second job right after grad was exec comp. And um, yeah, my career has kind of gone from there. Um, I just once met one person who landed um, directly a job in compensation. It was Amiel and he started first at a bank and then changed. Do you know Amiel? By any chance? No, I don't know Emil. No, no. I did listen to part of the podcast you did with him. Um, and I think another person was on too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Stratus as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It was a um, conversation episode. Um, how do you land a job in executive conversation? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So because my education was in investments and finance, um, and a lot of my education I had in uh, things like forensic accounting and mutual funds, when I was looking for jobs, I saw this job about 
investments, but it was about executive compensation. So when I went for the interview, I think they hired me because I asked them a couple of questions about the exec comp programs and how they worked and was asking, oh, are these like phantom stocks and things like that? And they were like, how do you know that? I said, I just got out of school. That's all. Um, I had no HR background, no HR training, no, absolutely nothing. Um, So I learned everything on the job, literally. But it was fun. The beginning of my career was really fun. And I didn't know compensation existed as a profession at all. I thought it was all just HR stuff and people got paid, you know? So once I got into comp, I was like, oh, there's something much bigger here. Uh, behind the scenes that most people probably don't even know exists is happening in order for them to get paid. So that's pretty cool. Nice. And um, so uh, how did you work your way up to what you're doing now? Because you're also um, consulting now, right? Yeah. So I do part-time consulting, my company uh, Work Imagined. So um, it's kind of weird. It kind of goes along with my actual personal journey. So I was saying I had lived in the States and I moved to London and moved back. And there was a period of time in my life where I didn't want to work um, in an office anymore. And this is before the pandemic. So I decided I was going to work remotely and I found a remote job and I moved into a new role um, from that remote job. So um, what happened was I was in exec comp and I had an opportunity to work on a really big, big project. The company was quite large, 200,000 employees around the world, 120 companies, uh, countries, and almost 120 companies as well. (laughs) <laughs> they kind of went together. Um, and they were doing a whole brand new job catalog because they were going to implement Workday. So this was about a decade ago, roughly, or so. Um, and I, my boss was just like, do you want in? And I was like, yeah, I want in on the project. Why not? You know, like, let's let's do all the big, hard things. So um, that got me into broad-based compensation out of executive compensation. And broad-based is just anything non-executive, you know, basically. Um, and so from there... I got another job and then I decided to work, remote, work remotely and I moved to to Germany. Um, and I decided that I was going to be a little more interested in DEI um, because I have been spending a lot of my career um, working with people individually, as well as working with hiring managers and talent acquisition and leaders around pay equity. So um, even from the beginning with executive compensation, um, the first company I worked for and the second company I worked for were government contractors, and they had to do pay equity analyses for the executive populations. Um, And so starting there and then moving along, it just became a part of my work. Um, And then when I moved to Germany, I really got interested in whether or not Europe was the Germany and Europe as a whole was different from America as a whole and how they were handling compensation and pay transparency and pay equity and all these different things, um, which led me to be more interested in how DEI was being connected to compensation, which I learned it was no different in America. It was not. <laughs> it was not being connected at all. And I was like, hey, you've got some people over here that like see equity or not equity all the time, you know, and um So, yeah, and then 2020 happened, right? We've got the pandemic. We had George Floyd, uh, George Floyd's murder, Black Lives Matter. And that really had you seeing a lot of companies come out with statements, right, about we support Black lives, we support Black and brown people, we support uh, marginalized identities. Um, And as nice as it was to see, I was a little skeptical. I mean, because I had just come from the States and they've been doing DEI stuff for 50 plus years. Um, And I, as a comp person, hadn't seen those direct lines um, from DEI to comp, even though there is a direct line to DEI to comp. Um, So, yeah, that time frame, the pandemic and all of that really had me thinking a lot about, well, as a compensation professional, how do I talk about diversity, equity and inclusion from my perspective, right? Versus like trying to say I am a DEI practitioner for everything DEI, which I am not. Um, I am a DEI advocate. I learn every day about uh, new identities and their experiences and people and how they're handling their experiences at work. But my everyday job is in compensation, right? And talking about money and pay and benefits and rewards. Um, And so I realized it kind of came over time and thinking and writing and talking with people that really DEI, it's, it's baseline. It, it came from people wanting to experience dignity at work. That's really what it was about. Um, so many, 
So many people in the workplace don't fit the mold, whether it's the mold of society or the mold of a workplace, depending on where you work and live. And when you don't fit the mold of any sort, you inevitably end up being kind of on the outside of something that is really important, which is a collective group of people who are working together towards a particular goal for, in this case, for a business. Um, And so a lot of people were just like, hey, we... We want to come to work. We want to be recognized and valued and respected. And um, we want to be able to do good work and enjoy the work that we do. Like, this is the basics of why we go to work. Well, besides getting paid, obviously. Um, So, um, yeah. So I just realized it was dignity and out came the dignity standard. And what is the dignity standard? It is a... Well, I'm, I'm, it's a cultural concept and DEI concept, which is um, basically t- made up of four components, uh, respect, value, ethical treatment, and accountability. And the idea is that those together and the behaviors that go with those particular components make up dignity. And um, yeah, we're all accountable for making sure that everybody at work experiences it. So um Yeah, that's the dignity standard. And essentially, I also wanted to make sure that, you know, DEI practitioners have a hard job because most of them are kind of grassrootsing it in corporate environments, right? They're trying like from the ground up, trying to get some swell and some excitement and some interest and investment. Um, And what I noticed as I talked in the States and in Germany and in other parts of Europe with different DEI practitioners is that if you asked them all what their why for DEI, what is their purpose, what drives them for DEI, they all have a different reason, which is fair enough because DEI usually comes out of someone's experience. And they're thinking, you know, I want to be a part of something that helps change this thing for people like me and people who are experiencing similar things as me. Um, but part of the problem with having different whys is that then it's hard to be super collective broadly. I don't mean just in a company, right? I mean, also connecting to other companies, connecting across uh, societies and cultures and language and whatnot. And if you think about things like um, accounting, for example, um, in the States, we have the generally accepted accounting principles. And I had to learn a bunch of stuff when I was in school because I was going to school for finance and accounting was a part of that. Um, and in the UK, I think it's chartered something. I forget what they call it, but they also have a, a book of rules for accountants and how we actually account for money, profit and loss statements, right? I'm um, sure the same thing in Germany. Um, but you don't have that for DEI practitioners. There's no like collective set of anything. It's just, we all know that this is the right thing to do intuitively to build programs and support business strategy to ensure that we bring in diverse talent, that we make sure we have equitable programs and that we include diverse talent and opportunities and resources and development and growth. We know it's the right thing to do, but the collective set of principles, collective set, like a, there's no Bible, you know, for a lack of and better term. Especially I think the starting point is hard. Yeah. yeah. Because let, let's go into... Um... Maybe the startup world. What I see, a lot of companies are founded from maybe college friends. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then there are the free white male um, mm-hmm. that are young. And then they're yeah. friends. And now they have this idea about this company. And then they start. But they maybe don't even have, let's say, um, friends or their friend. The cir- circle of friends is, is maybe also not even diverse. Yeah. Yeah. And then this all gets started and rolling. And the first hires are like me hires. And then the like me hires like the other like me hires. And at some point you find yourself in a situation where um, hopefully you realize by yourself that maybe thinking also a bit outside the box and being a bit more open regarding um, how how you design the, the workplace or the teams and so on, right? Um, that some point, at some point people start thinking, but usually it's it's never the time until somebody is raising their voice or somebody is demanding it. Um, mm-hmm. So how do you see that? Especially I think in Germany, um, I don't mm-hmm. know compared to the US um, if, if it's also the same, but I think in Germany, there are a lot of German Germans. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> Right. German Germans. Um. <laughs> no, like, like the, the, the traditional, yeah. right? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, so so um, how, how, how do you think the whole um, conversations can even be um, started or the whole decision-making process can even be started, especially for non-diverse environments? 
Yeah, I think what's interesting that you mentioned is the like me hires, right? And um, as a compensation professional, one of the things that I have been lucky enough to to talk to people about is things like who deserves to build wealth. So if you're thinking from a holistic view as a founder, and part of the reason why you found a company is because you, some people just need to do that. I asked you and you were like, Michelle, I have to run my own business. Like there's just no other way. (laughs) I can't work another way. Some people are just like that. They need to be entrepreneurs. My dad is similar. Um, Other people are totally fine with nine to five. No problem at all with it. But When you're founding a business, obviously what you're trying to do is build some sort of product or service, right? Serve a particular customer group and make money. That is the point. (laughs) Anybody who says otherwise, be skeptical, right? Because that is part of it. You want to earn a living and earn a living for your employees if you have employees. Um, And what I like to think about when it comes to that conversation when you're getting started, especially to start up with founders, is, okay, we don't have to start talking about diversity first. Who deserves to build wealth? And who deserves to participate in wealth building? And that's what startups essentially are doing, right? They're bringing people in to help them build a, serv- a service and product and build a type of wealth, right? The value of the organization that will eventually become something tangible. Either they're purchased by someone or they go IPO or whatever. And if you have that conversation with founders, it gets them thinking and interrogating their own thought process about who they bring in. Because Ultimately, if you're bringing in everybody like you, it doesn't mean that everybody like you isn't great at their job, right? It doesn't mean that. They could all be incredible at their job and they could all be doing a wonderful job and you're all on the same page. But there's also a little bit there that makes you wonder, well, if everybody's on the same page all the time, or even if they're not, the viewpoint they bring in is only slightly skewed from the the midpoint or the, the, the area of starting. Right. Maybe we also need some people who think differently. And that includes not just diversity of thought, but you get diversity of thought by diversity of experience. And your diversity of experience comes as well from who you are in the society that you live in and the identities that you hold. So my experiences are different from your experiences and your experiences are different from Jesse's experience, for example, right? It's not just because we went to different schools and had different friends. It's because who we are in society and who are we perceive to be in society give us a certain experience. And that helps us in the workplace do better work, usually from different viewpoints. So the starting point for me um, with founders, because money is a big topic, right? Um, when you're bringing investment in, right? Whether it's seed investment or you're in your your round C, right? Um, or series C, I should say. Um, one of the things they're looking at is what do you do with that money, right? How do you disperse that cash in order to build your business? And one thing that usually doesn't happen is, all right, how do we take part of this money to make sure that our compensation programs, right, are aligned and internally fair, and then maybe even externally competitive, depending on where we are in our stage. Um, but that comes down to who deserves to participate in wealth building. And wealth building includes what you get paid, the base salary, not just about the, the stock that you might get from the company as well. In case you like my show, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Um, interesting. I never ap- approached it or heard it in that way of looking in, in into the wealth building aspect. So um, what is a conversation ar- around that looking like? So um, yeah, how, yeah. this would be interesting to me. So because I started my career in executive compensation, I got to see firsthand at really big companies who was building the wealth, right? And at really big companies, right? These are traditional 100-year-old companies with a bunch of people, right? These are not the startups, but they used to be startups, right? (laughs) At some point, maybe 100 years ago, we didn't call them that, but they used to be startups. Um, And for me, that conversation looks like who in our organization, right, what is earning the most, What does their stock package look like and why? Why? I had a conversation with the chairman of a board once and we were talking about the pay of executives and I was doing some analysis and trying to, you know, show him here's externally what it looks like and here's what we're doing here and giving some recommendations. And the chairman of the board said, well, the CEO should make the most. 
because that's what everybody else does. And I thought, well, it's true. Everybody else does that usually. But there are cases where CEOs don't make the most money in base salary, right? Um, For example, there's one company I worked for and one I've heard of where the top level, you know, here in Germany called management board, in America called the executive team, their salaries weren't four and five hundred thousand dollars a year, or even more than that. They weren't. They were very modest, below one hundred k, and their stock packages were quite massive. Right, that was the the makeup for it. Um, so, does the CEO have to make the most money? I don't know that that has to be true. We could challenge that. Um, should everybody in the company have stock? Right. So, who doesn't have stock in the company? We're talking about wealth building. If stock is a big part of a compensation package, especially for startups, right? So, is everybody getting it? Or is just are just a few people getting it? Are we capping it at a certain level saying this level and above gets it, this level and below does not? Um, that to me is a little bit strange. Now, of course, anybody who understands equity understands that there's a there's a pot, right? You don't have unlimited shares. There's a pot of shares that you need to distribute appropriately. And you don't need a burn rate that's so high that, you know, in a couple of years you have no stock anymore, which means you can no longer give any stock unless you do something different. Um, but When you think about the fact that, especially in a startup, every single person, when you're at 25 people, when you're at 50 people, every single person is doing something that is contributing to the greater good of the company. Every person. And they're doing more than just one job. Let's get real, right? They're not just sitting in their silo going, clicking the button. They're doing everything. And so shouldn't everybody have it from the person that's doing workplace experience, to the person that's doing finance, to the person that's doing procurement, to the person that's, you know, a software engineer, right? Shouldn't everybody participate in the wealth they're developing? Because again, you're there at a startup and you're developing a type of wealth by increasing the value of the company. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. And it, it also, I think one one aspect that is always important, in my opinion, is this, the stage, so the timing piece um, in terms of what is the current company stage. Yeah, mm-hmm. And if you yeah. consider maybe a management board of a very established company, base salaries overall are maybe way much higher and also yeah, big comp packages overall totally. But also if you're just building up something and you're taking the risk, right? Um, I think, yeah, b- base salary doesn't have to be the highest component, especially of a CEO. And I also... Um, remember in my career but also um what i did for customers um i always challenged that um when some leaders said ah this person is for instance too senior um so this person would now earn more than me <laughs> so i cannot <laughs> i cannot hire that person and i said why why yeah why <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> thinking it a bit differently maybe also saying um why don't you see it as a benefit and saying, hey, there is somebody with a certain um, set of value that is a social value is always price, right? And if somebody is maybe earning much or asking um, for a lot of money, um, there is some kind of value behind it usually. Yeah. yeah so why be. not seeing yeah, it should be, yeah. So why not seeing this also as value where you could also benefit from it? And it's not always about the just plump sum of money. I think that's so um not holistically thought and not really sophisticated or um um mature to look at it in that way. Um, yeah. But also this is also what what would interest me um in terms of stock compensation and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes also companies then say, yeah, we should pay less on the base because they get stock or candidates should accept it. I think in the beginning um, of the whole startup boom in Germany, for instance, um, this was maybe a bit a bit more accepted. But at some point, everybody who got a funding, did a press release and then went out with, oh, we have this big amount of money now. And now everybody gets rich who is joining somewhere in the future. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Maybe, exactly. Maybe some, yeah, exactly. And then at some point when everybody did it, um, you could not negotiate and saying, hey, yeah, you get so many stocks and therefore you take less base. So I think this is what got harder also from a candidate perspective and also candidates um, realize that sometimes it's also just a big bet and I have a living standard and I need to have at least my living standard plus more, of course, because I also want to not just wake up for working. <laughs> <laughs> so um how how do you see all this um compensation in terms of talent acquisition um aspects right so the whole yeah. 
comp packages, how can you sell them, how maybe not selling them to set the wrong expectations. Also considering the diversity aspect, because sometimes maybe for the same role, somebody gets more, somebody gets less. How do you deal with that? It's a, it's a question of, um, are we, do we, what rules do we have? So that's the question. What rules do we have around or principles, right? Some people don't like the term rules, but principles, what principles do we have around, um, offers? And I have seen this across my career a thousand times. And I know you have, because you work in talent acquisition. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I give this example sometimes to people. There was a point in time in my career where I was the compensation partner for a, f- a couple of different business units for a company I worked for. And so that means that co- I taught talent acquisition and hiring managers and HR business partners, right? And I had a talent acquisition partner call me and we had this particular program for new engineers, not software engineers. We're talking mechanical, electrical. They worked on uh, big physical projects like airplanes and things like that. And um, they called me and said, hey, Nichelle, uh, this particular gentleman, who, by the way, comes out of a program that our company works with to obtain uh, diverse talent, right? So he's a black, he's a young black man. He has a bachelor's degree. He's coming in as a XYZ engineer. And can I offer 70K? And I was like, well, that's a part of the salary range. Yeah, sure. No problem. You don't have to call me for that. You know, it's fine. Um, this person was new, so it was okay. But I was like, yeah, you're good. Go ahead. The next day, and I'm not even joking, not even 24 hours later, same person calls me and says, hey, Nichelle, you know, we're ramping up this program. Uh, I've got a, a woman of Asian descent. She's got a master's, master's degree and a bachelor's degree, and she was in the same program. And I want to offer her 60. Is that okay? And I said, you want to offer her 60? Wait, didn't we talk yesterday about this other person? Um, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. And I said, hey, I don't care what you offer either one of them, as long as it's in the salary range and it's the same amount of money. Because they're coming in, right, newbies into this organization. So I real and that happened over the course of my career a number of times, but that particular example was the first time it happened to me where I was like, wait, this person doesn't realize that they're already m- creating inequity between just two people in the program. How many times have they done this in this program they're hiring out of? So it's about the principles that you have and, and the people, the hiring managers and talent acquisition, do they understand those principles for hiring? Um, what does negotiation mean, right? A lot of times hiring managers say, I have to be able to negotiate. Okay, so what are the principles for negotiation? Are we negotiating below the salary range or above the salary range or within it? And what is the percentage point of negotiation that makes sense, right? If we say that, you know, 25% of the total comp package must be stock and you're negotiating it down to 10%, you're obviously going to have an equity in base salary and in stock for everybody on the team that you're working with because that one person ended up getting way more in base. And I think it also comes down to recognizing that usually there's a bias attached to um, how people are making decisions. And it's not a bias that they um, are deliberately using, right? It's If you think about the example I just gave you, it has been proven study after study that women usually don't negotiate and women usually also do not ask for what they really want or ask for the highest amount they could. So in this example, you've got a young black man, a young Asian woman. He asks for 70, he gets 70. She asks for 60, she gets 60, right? You'll hear this argument from hiring managers often. Well, we negotiated. Yeah, but you also negotiated with the other person and you know you were giving them more money and you know they're doing a similar or equal value job. So it also comes down to the individual recognizing that they have to, in that process, combat that type of societal issue, right? Where I, as a woman, am going to ask for less and you as a man might ask for more. I am not going to ask for less, but I'm just saying <laughs> this This is kind of a general statement um, simply because of how we're socialized uh, and simply because of what outside people think women's work is actually valued as. It doesn't matter if you're a software engineer and a software engineer. People automatically assume as a woman, your value is worth less. That's at least in Western society where I'm from. (laughs) That's how it is. That's in the psyche of society. It's in the psyche of people. And that creates a bias. 
So it's principles, it's interrogating your own kind of decision making, right? Do I have bias here? Is it equal across my team or equitable, at least the way I've been offering jobs? And talent acquisition has a super awesome um, role where they actually get to see all that data, right, across different teams. So if you are a talent acquisition person and you're helping, you know, legal finance and marketing, right, for some reason that usually happens to be the trio, <laughs> together. They go together and they get hired uh, the same talent acquisition partner. Um, what usually you have the opportunity to do is look at that data, right? And you compensation doesn't have to be the only place that compensation data is analyzed, especially when we're talking about hiring rates, right? So you as a TA partner can say, hey, over the past you know three months, we've been hiring like crazy in these three departments that I am you know working with. And We've already talked to comp and we understand that these particular roles are of, of similar value, even if they're in different departments, right? But I'm seeing some crazy stuff here. And in the moment, you know, I'm rolling with my hiring manager, but now a step back makes me go, wait, 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 what have we done here? Or even better, during the hiring processes with hiring managers saying, listen, we had a conversation last week about XYZ candidate and you were totally fine with the 120. Now, all of a sudden, a new candidate comes along, and I can't see much difference in the value they're going to add to the organization. By the way, it's all a gamble. There's no such thing as anybody knowing for sure that someone's going to come in and add extreme value to the team. It doesn't work like that, right? You're taking a gamble. You do the best of your hiring process, and you hope they come in and do a good job. Um, so it's also about talent acquisition partners. And it's a difficult ch- Look, I'm, I've never worked as a recruiter. I cannot imagine the amount of drama and conversation that is had with hiring managers and HR business partners. So I'm not trying to make it seem off the cuff easy, but it does require that those principles are in place. Everybody understands them. Everybody's accountable to following them. And there's always some challenge in that process to make sure we have fairness and pay. In case you have any feedback or anything you want to share with me, please send me an email on thomas at peoplewise.com or hit me up on LinkedIn. And in case you really enjoy the show, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Well said. Um, so I found myself in both situations, yeah, where I pushed for the equal pay piece, but also where I pushed for a non-equal pay piece. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes there were situations where there was really crazy urgency and I just tried to work on principles as well, right? And um, one principle was also the commercial or success in a certain strategy way and there was let's say a certain urgency on time and that's always then problematic when this comes in <laughs> um, that you sometimes work under constraints right and you don't mm -hmm. have more choices and then um, i sometimes even push for okay certain hires you need to now make outside of the salary range because sometimes maybe it's not updated yeah to what the market currently says for certain roles but um, for other persons, it, it might work out. So what do you do? Do you now um, change the whole comp structure for everybody or do you just accept the in inequality, right? And I never know what is right in a certain moment to what extent because I think that's always a, a, a principle discussion during mm -hmm. a certain period. Um, but I think overall, it all should go towards um, equality and equity, but um, it doesn't have to be always be the case immediately. Um, but of course, the idea should be there because you cannot always just um, provide it and accomplish it, right? I think that's really hard. And that's um, also an I ideal world, especially if you're going um, through stages where there is not even a comp infrastructure and nobody really thought about There's it. That. <laughs> There's this part, right? There's definitely that part. I mean, I think that's why I call my company Work Imagined because um, I do believe that equity all the time is possible. Right. I don't think it's not possible. I, but one thing that I ask and I have asked more than one time to hiring managers and talent acquisition partners is you're going to make this choice. Because what usually happens is an established company, they come to comp and go, and somebody has a strong case, right? I have to get this role in, right? It's going to affect their job, right? Their boss has said, we need these things done. You are responsible to deliver this stuff. And then that person's like, <laughs> I got to hire the person, right? It's always like that. My question is always, are you, are you happy to tell your current team the salary of this person? Everybody gets stuck on that question. 
because they know, they know they would never, they would never want it to come out that this person's coming in and making 20 grand more, right? 25 grand more than the team. They would never want that to happen. And so it stuck, it sticks them in the conversation. I say to them, just remember that question I asked you when you offer this job. Because inevitably, Thomas, it comes out. I'm telling you, it never stays quiet. Now, I don't, I don't know how it happens. I don't know who is out here, what little fairies out here, like telling people in their ears, guess what happened? It happens every time. It happened to me. In the beginning, the second job I had in my career, um, I was paid 10 grand less than uh, a similar valued role, a person that's been valued role. I had more experience. I had more education. And it came around. I found out, right? And I can tell you right now, it doesn't matter if a person loves the job they're doing, loves their team, and loves the company they work for, right? I don't know that they need to, but many people do really enjoy what they do and their, and their colleagues and their company. But the moment they feel like they've been treated unfairly, right? And this goes back to dignity. The moment I feel disrespected, the moment I feel devalued, the moment I feel people's ethics are in question. Everything that I enjoy about what I do goes out the window. And money is such an emotional topic. It's not logical. It is not numbers. Everyone thinks that, um, but it's not. So I, as a comp person, recognize that hiring managers and TA partners are in that position sometimes when they're hiring people. You know, we believe we need X, Y, Z, so we must pay X, Y, Z. And we say what the market is paying. It is true that um, compensation ranges essentially are meant to establish stability in pay. That's their job. They're meant to be long term. They're not meant to be uh, changed every single year. Some companies do that because sometimes they have instability in their business model and they're not sure how to do things. But in mature companies, you don't have salary ranges changing every year. Now, it doesn't mean that they couldn't adjust and shift, but we're talking about deep dive analysis and shifting all the time. Um, that doesn't, doesn't, it shouldn't happen. And that's because if you go back to look at the fact that someone has to take this money from somewhere, that's finance. <laughs> it's essentially accounts payable, basically. I mean, you know, I'm making it simplified, but they have to pay this money. So you can't have salary ranges that change all the time because it also puts the business finances in flux in a way that's unnecessary. So yes, you're going to be in a situation where someone comes in and you're like, this is a hot skill. The, or the skills they have are super hot right now. They cost way more money. We got to make something happen. And I just asked the question, are you happy for this to come out to your team? And when it comes out to your team, it's never if, when it comes out to your team, what damage control do you plan to do? Hmm. So my thought process is we as compensation professionals, as talent acquisition partners, as hiring managers, we have to get more transparent. This is also how you express dignity in the workplace around comp. We have to be able to say to employees, we, this is our compensation system. Here are the policies and programs and um, principles. And within that is sometimes somebody's going to make more money than you do. That's the reality, right? Not everybody's going to make the exact same amount of money. And even with the EU pay directive coming out, you know, this is really interesting in, in the EU now because equal pay for equal work is kind of a US term, but in the EU pay directive, it's, you know, equal pay for similar or equal valued work, right? And, um, People will say, well, I should make exactly as much as they should make. I can't say that's not true, to be honest. After, after this much time doing compensation, I can't say that someone shouldn't make exactly the same as someone else. I can't say that. But what companies have done over the years, they've created all these different um, components that help to differentiate people, uh, people's skill sets or people's output, right? Performance, for example. I know that I think Siemens a few years ago actually got rid of individual performance ratings. They were just like, this is useless. You know, it's not helping anybody, um, which helps to keep aligned in pay, right? Um, and don't quote me on that, but I think it was Siemens. But um, plenty of companies have done that, but they no longer, no longer do performance. So it's a long-winded version, but I think ultimately there are, there are always going to be times where the principles and policies are um, are going to be pushed and stretched, right? Because of what's happening right now in the moment. But we also always have to think about the long term, and that question is something that I always ask to help them do that. Good question, and I also ask myself that. And you know what I did in. I think most cases, I don't know if it was every case, but really most cases, when I pushed for that, I also um, 
made it transparent and said, hey, this is what I do right now and this is the reason. Yeah. And I, I, I know that it's now um, the situation we are in, but I accept it because I think overall these are the thinking, this is the thinking process and this is the decision coming out of it. So people accepted it, but mm -hmm. they did not, of course, enjoy it and say, yeah, but mm -hmm. they could they could understand, yeah? Yes. And then the consequence was, okay, this also means that for the next comp round, for instance, um, We consider that as also a hot topic, not just making the hot skill higher, but this will then turn into a next hot topic to say, what are we now doing with the inequality and how do we make it more equal again? I'm going to ask you a question. Does it have to be the next comp round? doesn't have to. It can also be immediate. But, you know, sometimes it's harder to accomplish that. And of course, you can push mm -hmm. for that if it's really necessary. Um, but I also agree. This is also questions, um, what I always ask. But, you know, sometimes there are also these limitations. So I think that's something then um, what you can push for, but you don't have to overly fight for it to say it has to be, has to be. Because sometimes I, I think there is also, as you said, right, value is price. It is also in, in the just in, in the term when you just look at the definition of the Latin word, value really is price. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same meaning. Um, so maybe for a short time, the value is really, really high. So it can be inequal for a short time, but it should not be an um, an overall thing to to accept. Because, you know, I, I, I saw this so often and I think it's so hard um, to accomplish, but it's possible, as you said, and you need to push for it. I, I think it's also the, um, finding the right balance and the right way um, is really important there. But it's just the the very much talent acquisition head because, um, <laughs> as you as as you said, right? I I I had a lot of these conversations and <laughs> fights and and yeah. So this is it's funny you say limitations because um, I was having a, a conversation years ago with my cousin. I was visiting her and we were just driving around and she said, you know, everything is made up. And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, every single thing that you see around you, the store right there, those cars, that sign, the blah, blah, blah. Everything is literally made up, you know? And when I think about, I think about that all the time because as you mentioned, there are limitations. These are limitations created by someone, right? Exactly. So they're exactly. not, they're, these are made up limitations. But also, I have never worked in a company where if one of the executives, right, who has the highest level of decision making for that unit, right? If they say, I want X, there is not a time in my career where X is. Agree. Yeah, agree. <laughs> so, I agree. I also think that it's really important to remember that these are all decisions being made by people and it's all made up. Now, are there intricacies and complexities that come along with decision making and these types of decisions around comp? Absolutely. But does that mean we can't have a workplace where fair pay and equal play is top of mind always? No, it means we can. But the question is, Whose mind is it on? Mm -hmm. And it's just like DEI. DEI is usually, like I said, some grassroots thing where someone's trying to get everything together and they're trying to pull people together, right? But can you imagine what would happen if we flip that? Where if the top, the highest level decision maker in an organization says, I care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. In the next three months, I want to see these three things go. They would happen, Thomas. They would happen so fast. I know, 100%. I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> and, you know, this is why I said it doesn't always happen immediately because usually you need to work your way up with a case or whatever and showcase why and so on, right? So this is important to get this buy-in. Um, But really it's not the point, though. It shouldn't be – it'd be great if it wasn't buy-in, right? Work imagine in my mind. It's not buy-in from the top, the uh, uh, bottom up. It's top down. It's uh, – Yeah. You don't have to buy in when your boss tells you, right? You don't have to buy in. It's a done I know. You know? So anyways, I mean, it's just – I think to myself, I imagine a workplace where decision makers have these things on their mind, right? Fair pay, equal pay, transparency, strong policies, fair pay programs, DEI, and where the organization operates that way because that's the top line business expectation. It's not some um, bottom up push that then gets kind of thrown away because someone leaves the company or some executive now says, oh, I don't care anymore. You know, you don't want that. No, I, I like the imagination and um, hopefully this can be more a reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we already a bit over time. So um, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, who is a guest that I should interview next that you know I don't know yet? 
Oh man, it's messed up because I was going to say Jesse, but obviously, you know, Jesse. Um, <laughs> um, you know, talent acquisition is really interesting to me. And I've never been a recruiter. I'm not sure I could be one. I could be one, but I'm not sure I want to be one. It's, it's a challenge, challenging role. I think Lisa Bartlett at Talent International. So um, she's a regional director for talent here in Berlin. Uh, talent is a company out of the UK. Um, I can also send you her details if you want later. Um, but yeah, Lisa Bartlett would be a good a good person. I was so going to say Jesse, so I had to, <laughs> I had to think of someone else. Yeah, sure. sure. But Lisa's great. I mean, I'm not picking Lisa as a second <laughs> choice. It's just she's great. She's wonderful. I think you would love chatting with her. Cool. Um, I'm happy to do so if she's open for it. So um, um, thanks for the for the episode. I really enjoyed it. Oh, me too. Thank you so much. I, I feel like I rambled and rambled, but I enjoyed it too. And um, thank you for asking me to be on. <laughs>